Hello and welcome to First Evangelical Lutheran Church in Poughkeepsie, New York. This is a virtual worship for the third Sunday after the Epiphany, January 24th, 2021. A reminder to all of our members that today is our annual congregational meeting. You should have received in your email a link to that Zoom meeting. If you have not received it or if you have any issues, please remember um, to reach out to one of us. Reach out to Nancy Slingerlin, our council president, or any of your friends in this congregation so we can help you get set up to be an important part of this important meeting. Also, today we are welcoming Pastor Chris Mitlowski, assistant to the bishop, as our guest preacher, and we are so glad that he was able to join us. If you are joining us for the first time, a very special welcome. In below this YouTube video, there are links where you can learn more about us and our community in Poughkeepsie. So welcome everybody, and let us now continue with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider the generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and the promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen.
Grace for our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your Spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson comes from chapter 3 of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days' walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Here ends the reading. We will pray verses from Psalm 62 responsively. For God alone I wait in silence. Truly, my hope is in God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall never be shaken. In God is my deliverance and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in God always, O people. Pour out your hearts before the one who is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath. Those of low estate cannot be trusted. Placed on the scales together, they weigh even less than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. In robbery, take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it, that power belongs to God. Steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay all according to their deeds. The second reading comes from the seventh chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John were in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord.
My name is Pastor Chris Metlowski. I work on the Bishop staff in the Metro New York Synod as a deployed assistant. I've been with you before, and it's a delight to be back with you again. God's peace be with you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Fantastical fantasy. Outrageous. Bizarre. The tallest of tall tales. Jonah, a prophet chosen by God, was given a task to go to a particular place and deliver a particular message. Go at once to Nineveh, the great city, the Lord told him, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, instead of doing what the Lord commanded, Jonah bolted in the absolute opposite direction. Now, we're not told at this point in the story exactly why he refused. Nineveh, was a monumentally massive city, about 60 miles wide. It was occupied with Gentiles who ruthlessly crushed the kingdom of Israel. They were Jonah's enemies. But Jonah boarded a ship which headed in the exact opposite direction. The text tells us he set out to flee the presence of the Lord. Now comes the fantastical fantasy part the part of the story we've heard since we were children. The ship he's on set sail, the Lord stirred up a mighty storm, all the sailors were terrified and began tossing cargo overboard to lighten the load, to better their chances of survival. It didn't work. So they cast lots, which determined that Jonah was the cause of the calamity. Jonah told the sailors to toss him overboard and the sea would quiet down. They did. It did. Jonah was swallowed by a big fish provided by God and stayed in its belly three days and three nights. I think we can say that God can be pretty convincing. Jonah came around and agreed to do as God told him. The big fish spewed Jonah out onto the dry land. Outrageous. Bizarre, right? This brings us to our first lesson this morning, Jonah is commanded a second time to get up and go and proclaim the message, I tell you, said the Lord. The reluctant, uninspired, unenthusiastic prophet trudged a full day's walk into the city and offered God's oracle, the shortest sermon ever. Forty days more, Jonah said, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight simple words, just eight words, and everything radically changed. Everyone in the city believed it and immediately responded with repentance. The entire city fasted and put on sackcloth, a sign of, of penance, uh, of self-punishment. Even the king, who then instructed all the animals should also wear sackcloth. I guess the idea being if a little sackcloth is good, more sackcloth is gooder. They turned from their evil ways, scripture says. The people of Nineveh changed and God changed God's mind. The tallest of tales, right? Now here's the part of the story that follows. Jonah was angry with God, absolutely furious that God changed God's mind and forgave them. He said, that's why I fled. I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. Jonah threw an I knew it tantrum. He didn't want to do what God told him because he knew who God is and what God was going to do. Forgive his repentant, savage enemies. God's grace, God's mercy, God's chesed, the Hebrew word for steadfast love, chesed, is a relentless, unstoppable, enduring, persistent, never-ending love, an amazing treasured gift for us and for those we love. But boy, do we struggle when God offers this holy gift to those 
we think don't deserve it. Those people, those who have hurt us, our adversaries, those different from us, our tendency is to try to manage and control the flow of God's amazing grace as we see fit. But here's the thing, here's the thing, we ain't in charge. Beloved, we are simply messengers, called, chosen, baptized, and sent to bear witness to God's chesed everywhere we go, to everyone God loves, and we know who that includes, for God so loved the whole world. This community of faith gathered in Poughkeepsie is an expression of God's hope, gifted to the whole world in the risen Christ. You all are recipients and witnesses of God's Easter grace, of Jesus coming among us to create a way where there was no way. And you are God's messengers of that hope for the sake of the world. If Jonah knew what was going to happen, imagine how hard it was to walk a day's journey into the heart of that wretched city, step by step, hour after passing hour, silently fuming because he knew the outcome would upset him. God is indeed a convincing and motivating God. The reluctant Jonah delivered God's message and everything changed. The disciples Jesus called at the start of his ministry literally dropped everything. They let go of their nets, their families, all that was familiar, all that created a sense of security and comfort and followed Jesus. For God is a convincing and motivating God. But those disciples, they struggled in their discipleship. They got things wrong, really wrong, often. They tried to impose their will instead of listening to Jesus. Now, despite their shortcomings and ours, God's steadfast love, chesed, in the risen Christ is ours always, and nothing will ever change that. That's the divine gift we are called to offer, to share, to freely give to others. A famous theologian once said, the church doesn't have a mission. God's mission has a church. The church doesn't have a mission. God's mission has a church. Like the many prophets and apostles and the disciples before us, we too are called and sent by God to bear witness to God's amazing grace, mercy, and love, to proclaim the message God commands us to proclaim. Now, most of us are not really public with our faith. Most of us keep our witness private. So this idea of being sent, being public, openly sharing our faith, telling God's story out there is really uncomfortable and scary at times. I served a congregation in Manhattan for 12 years, and one Ash Wednesday, I got this, this crazy notion to bring ashes to Union Square, a super busy transit hub about seven blocks from the church. I invited anyone in the congregation to go with me, believing that our witness is communal. Four others tepidly agreed to try. We put on our, our robes and our crosses. We, we brought our posters with easels and lots of internal anxiety, uncertain what would happen, wondering if anyone would approach us, wondering if the police would push us out of the park, worried what others might say to us. We were only a few steps out the front of the door on our way of the ch from the church when a young woman with bright neon green hairs that hair that was in, in spikes, she looked at us like we were the odd ones. When we got to the park, we paired off and set up our signs. And someone immediately walked up and asked, can I really get my ashes here now? And we said, yes, yes. And as we did with each person that day, we asked her first name. Then we asked what we might pray for on her behalf. And after imposing the ashen cross on her forehead, we placed our hands on her shoulders and we prayed. It was very moving. My heart was racing. 
And I wasn't sure if it was because we were so public or if that small part of Union Square in the middle of the world's capital suddenly became holy ground. By the end of the afternoon, we think we imposed ashes and prayed with about a thousand people, a thousand strangers who felt God's chesed. All of us were as giddy as could be as we returned to the church, eager to do it again. And each year our numbers grew. Others joined us, willing to step out of their comfort zones and try. One year we had 10 pairs set up all around Manhattan. A dear friend of mine, a big, strong New York City firefighter took the day off and, and paired off with me. He watched what I did for the first few people. Then as the next, next person walked up, I said, George, why don't you take the lead on this one? Well, he shot me a, a not so nice look and said uh, that it would be okay. So as he pulled that big thumb out of the jar of ashes to mark her forehead, his thumb was wiggling, it was shaking. He offered a spontaneous prayer. It was beautiful and heartfelt. The person thanked us and walked away. He turned to me and slammed me with his big elbow, almost knocking me over, saying, you just tossed me right into the deep end. Imagine a 40 plus year veteran of FDNY who has spent his life running into danger, into burning buildings as everyone else ran out. This guy was scared. There are all kinds of reasons we may not wanna go public sharing God's chesed, but the one who calls us and sends us, the one who pours relentless grace and mercy upon us is also the one who equips us with the courage, the words and the passion to do it. It truly is an act of faith, trusting the Lord. And through us, like through Jonah, lives are changed and blessed. During my last Ash Wednesday at the congregation, I remember it was super cold, very cold. So a crew of us went down into the subway on the southeast corner of Union Square and a line formed immediately of about 20 people deep, which lasted the entire afternoon. One person came up to me with a big smile. I asked his name, Arnold, he told me, Arnold. Then his expression dramatically changed and he frowned. He said, I haven't been to church for three years. So I kind of stepped in a little closer and invited him to tell me about it. He said that three years before, his beloved wife died, and soon after, he lost a child. Arnold was suffering, grieving. He was in deep pain and was very angry with God. I told him the Bible is full of people who were angry with God, who felt left down, let down, abandoned, forgotten. I reminded him about the parable of the good shepherd leaving the 99 sheep to seek the one that was lost and didn't stop searching until he found it, scooped it up and carried it back home. Then right there in that chaotic subway corridor, I marked Arnold with ashes and I laid my hands on top of his head and I prayed for that beautiful, wounded child of God. Arnold looked up, he thanked me, and just before he walked away, he said, you know, I couldn't walk into a church, but to today, the church came to me. God told Jonah, get up, go, proclaim the message that I tell you. 
Jesus came to Simon and his brother Andrew, and then to James and John, sons of Zebedee, and said, drop your nets and follow me. Their lives, their very purpose radically changed. Beloved, God has immersed us in God's amazing grace, mercy, and steadfast love. Our lives have been radically changed because of God's relentless persistence through the cross and the empty tomb. We are living witnesses to God's Easter hope, messengers sent to bear love. For all the Arnolds out there, all who are deeply wounded or angry, or distracted, or lost, those different from us, even those we deem unworthy, for God so loves the world. St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians, for it is God who as is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Or to put it in other words, the church doesn't have a mission. God's mission has a church. God's mission has you all. So get up, go, proclaim true and lasting hope in the Lord's chesed. Amen. Let us affirm our faith by saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Prayers of Intercession. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and deaconesses, and for musicians and servers, that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world, for non-profit and non-governmental organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcasts and all who await relief, especially those affected by the coronavirus, that in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For our congregation and community, for families big and small, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for all relationships, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. We continue to pray for the members of Good Shepherd Church in Levittown, New York. We also pray for Renata, for Judy, for Kevin's sister, Mary, and for Ricky's sister, Renata. We also pray for Lisa's mother, Barbara's mother, Alicia's father, and Beth's mother, as well as Caroline's cousin. Be with Sherry in her healing. 
and with Linda, Jean, and with Jim. Our prayers remain with all those among our immediate and extended church families who serve in medical settings. Nancy, Donna, Erica, Henry, Ryan, and Terry and Chaplain Kelly Ray at Lutheran Care. We pray for the Trevady family in India, for Linda's friend Sally, for Anne's niece and for her brothers, for Sally's mother Brantley, Beth's mother, for Maureen and Frank, Taryn and Chris, and Tom and Phil. We pray also for Ricky's other sister and for Scott's sister. We continue to pray for Eddie, Richard, and David, Dale and Dave, each according to their needs. We remember in our prayers today Erna and Michael, Tansu, Eunice, Louise, Alice, Mary, Adele's friend Anne, and Linda's cousin Sandy. We pray for Colin in his deployment overseas and for his family as they continue to support him long distance and for all members of our military together with their families and loved ones and for the chaplains who minister to them, including Lisa's husband, Anthony. And we pray for our Bishop Paul, assistant to the Bishop Chris, and for our presiding Bishop, Elizabeth, for St. John's Lutheran and for St. Paul's Episcopal Churches, and for the Lutheran Care Center, Dutchess County Interfaith Council, our ecumenical partners, including the World Council of Churches, and for the Church Universal. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In the ecumenical prayer cycle for today, our sisters and brothers in Cyprus, Greece, and Turkey have asked us to join them in praying for the healing of memories and wounds inflicted by early 20th century genocides of Armenian, Greek, and Assyrian communities and for current tensions in these lands. Ecumenical respect for all minority groups and their claims. Those who work for justice and reconciliation. The people who struggle because of economic and political crises in these countries. More stable de democratic governments that further the good of all. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith, whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. Merciful Father, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please share that peace with all the others you are with. As our Savior has taught us, so we pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hear the blessing. God the Creator, give us strength. Jesus, the beloved, give us hope. The Holy Spirit, the comforter, keep us in peace. Amen.
beloved of God. Go in peace and be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.